Greetings book lovers everywhere. I'm E-Train and welcome to E-Train Talks. I'm going to be honest, today is a pretty amazing day for me. I am so excited and honored to announce that joining me today is New York Times bestselling author of over 30 books and one of my favorite storytellers, Jennifer Nielsen. Aside from writing, Jennifer loves watching movies, taking walks, and best of all, reading. Three things we happen to have in common. Jennifer has done so much over the course of her writing journey, and I'm just in awe of her work. I happened to read a few things about Jennifer I thought I'd share. First, did you know that Jennifer's favorite author is J.K. Rowling? Me neither. And second, I read that her favorite food is pho. I've never heard of that food. I looked it up, and it looks like it might be pretty tasty. We'll learn, we'll learn all about that and more today in my chat with Jennifer Nielsen. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jennifer. It's a true honor having you on my podcast. Well, it is an honor to be on this podcast. I appreciate the invitation and all of those kind words in your introduction. Mm -hmm. So I read on your website that you originally wrote adult romance novels, but eventually realized that your true calling was children's fantasy. How did you come to this realization? Yeah, it was, I think, a little bit more than romance. I mean, there was definitely some lots of romance in it, but it was suspense novels, you know, just, uh, you know, danger lurking. Um, and I was not finding any success at all, like nothing in that genre. And, uh, and I, you know, then I'm a big fan of uh, the Harry Potter series of JK Rowling. And this was shortly before book seven was going to come out. I saw um, a post from somebody just saying, well, could you write the seventh book? Because ultimately the Harry Potter books is a mystery. Why did Harry survive the killing curse? And the mystery writer in me wanted to see if I could take all of the clues from the first six books and just write that seventh book for myself, just as fan fiction. It was never going to be published, never even shared. But I wrote as if I were in the Harry Potter world and it just lit up my imagination. And I thought, I am having more fun writing this fan fiction than I've had in anything I've written for myself. That's when I knew I needed to be writing for young people and, uh, and I've never looked back since then. Um, so I think fan fiction, it's just one of my favorite styles of writing because there are so many different interpretations of stories and just seeing every single person, like every person might have a different way of thinking about a book. And it's just so beautiful. Like, like what you said, the characters come alive and people see them in different ways. Yeah, exactly that. And it was just, a, it was just a playground, uh, for my imagination at that time, um, until I, you know, and then when I made the shift and started building worlds and stories of my own, I knew I was in the right place. Wow. And I can tell that now you've written so many books for children. now historical fiction, fantasy, just so many different kinds of genres. And like you kind of expanded and it's all just, you're writing so many different genres and you're kind of inspiring so many readers. And it's not just children's fantasy, it's just children's books in general now. Yeah, well, thank you. That's very kind. So my next question is, what do you think the most important story component of any great middle grade fantasy book is? You know, um, I mean, there's there's so many different types of books and genres and, and approaches. But I think for me, um, it is a, I think in, in books for young readers, you need hope. You need hope. You need this promise that that just stay in the game and everything is going to work out. In in nearly every story, it's the main character is a young person who solves their problem. And, and so with that comes hope. So that when other people read about them, they can say, you know what, I have hard things too. But if they can do it, I can do it. So my books always have that element of hope in them. Yeah, that's a great component that I love about middle grade. There's always a light at the end of the tunnel. And mm -hmm. like, you always know that, like, you can kind of tell, like, in adult books, sometimes there isn't going to be a happy ending and in a lot of stories. But middle grade, there's always going to be light at the end of a tunnel and it's going to inspire readers. And that's kind of the goal of middle grade, just inspire readers to think differently. Yeah. Yeah. And even if it's not, you know, the happiest of ending, there's usually still something in there that's that's hopeful and 
And it, that's part of why I love middle grade is because, you know, writing for adults is sometimes just depressing, <laughs> you know, it's, ah, yeah. so kids are way more fun. Yeah, I like to think so. I am a kid. And sometimes I, like I've seen how my parents react to adult like newspapers, adult books, and it's not always a happy ending. It's not always, oh, I love this book, but you might like the book, but it's not really something that you love because you know that it's not really going to end well from the start. Exactly. Absolutely. So I read that you've always dreamed of becoming a published author. Now that you've accomplished that feat and so much more, what advice would you give young writers, aspiring authors who share the same dream? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, here's the thing. I, um, when, you're, when you're young and learning to write, you'll get this idea in your head. And the idea in your head, it's perfect. And it, and it just plays out like a movie. And everything about it is so amazing. You just want to live in your imagination in this world you've built or this magic system you've built. And you just imagine characters and story and everything in our head is perfect. And then we put words on paper. Yeah. And they're messy. And they don't always make sense. And they're, they're sometimes, you know, there's problems and we get stuck. And, and what very often happens to young people is we think, because the words that we just put on paper don't match that story in our head, that it's proof that they don't have talent. And that's when they give up, not only on the story, but on their dream of writing. And it's not that way. My, my advice to young people is be patient. That first bit of words you put on the paper, they're garbage because everybody's first drafts are garbage. My first drafts, I wouldn't show them to my mom and she kind of likes me, all right? Because they're not good. And so be patient and learn to rewrite because that's where we create art and never, never give up on a dream on the first draft. That's so important. And how did you, how did you just find the patience and find the belief that everything's going to be okay, that you're eventually going to be a published author after every first draft? Um, because I've, I've done that before where I've given up on the first draft. And then, um, and walked away from it and then regretted it. I've, I've lived that experience of thinking I don't have talent because my words don't make sense. Um, the way that I learned to hang in there is, is the recognition um, of all of the lessons I've learned from every book I've ever written. I can do hard things um, and I don't mind failing. I just, I'm not a person who will ever give up. Well, I think that's advice for everybody, whether you've already published 30 books or you haven't even published one yet. Never give up. It doesn't matter how bad your first draft might be or how amazing you think it's going to be. Just never give up and keep going. I think that's just great advice. Thank you. Thank you. So let's dive a bit into the Ascendant series. Like mm -hmm. I said earlier, what a fast paced, thrilling and fun page turner. How and when did you come up with the storyline? Okay, well, I have tried to narrow it down to the exact moment that I think the story began. And there, you know, there's a lot of you know things that yeah. came together. But if I go to the exact moment it began for me, when I had the idea, my daughter was really young, and she loved these Barbie DVDs, and I hated them. <laughs> uh, they were like making my brain melt, but. <laughs> She loved them so much. She wanted to watch them every day. And if we had to watch one, the, the movie I hated the least was uh, Princess and the Pauper about a poor girl and a princess who have to switch places. And uh, so with False Prince, this story of murder and danger and adventure and, and so much trouble and, this, and sword fighting and all of these, I'm pretty sure it started with a Barbie movie. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's, that's, you can find inspiration anywhere, even a Barbie movie, like you can find inspiration on walks, but I never thought that you could, you would find inspiration for, for like death, for sword fighting, for all <laughs> of these scary aspects to false prints from a Barbie movie. Yeah, it's, it's where it begins, but that's, that's what it is to be a writer. You know, the um, author of Ender's Game is Orson Scott Card. He said that every one of us passes 10,000 story ideas every single day. And that if you're a good writer, maybe you will see five or six of them 
and most people don't see any. The trick of being a writer is learning to see ideas where other people just walk straight past them. What are some common places to find these ideas? Uh, you know what, they're everywhere. They're in um, the lyrics to music, they're in conversations, they're in the news, they're in, um, you know, just pictures or things that we've read before. We get an idea from a movie. Uh, the, the trick is when you notice something for any reason that you notice it, you grab hold of that with your imagination and you start to ask questions. Um, the questions will lead you to story. And so it's um, finding ideas is the art of asking story questions. That's so powerful. And I think that kind of helps all of us. It's even more advice, like just always look for inspiration. Well, don't, but sometimes inspiration will just kind of creep up on you and you have to keep asking questions. If you have an idea, just keep asking questions, keep moving forward. Don't give up. It all kind of ties into just never give up. Exactly. You totally get that. So most people don't know this about me, but before reading middle grade fiction, I was pretty obsessed. Well, not obs just obsessed. I only read nonfiction history reads, and I'm a huge fan of historical fiction now. So I'm very interested in knowing who or what inspired you to write a historical fiction novel based on the events of World War I. Um, for Lines of Courage, um, I, I think where it began is with the uh, Wonder Woman movie when it came out. And, uh, and the initial comic books, I, I believe it's set in World War II, but the producers of the movie set um, that in um, World War I. And the reason they did is because they said that they understood that a lot of the events happening in our world now are more uh, similar to the events happening in World War I. And so they thought it would just be a more relevant movie. And I thought about that and I thought, how? And I realized I don't know enough about World War I to understand why they thought that would be more relevant. And so I just started doing this research and, and starting to figure that out and realizing it's they were absolutely spot on correct. And the more wow. I learned, the more I wanted to write about World War I, but I couldn't just write about one episode of World War I. So that's how we get five kids and five countries and five years of war is, uh, is to recognize that we have to tell the whole story of World War I. Yeah, and I had no idea that World War I, it, you took inspiration from Wonder Woman. I didn't know that that was set in World War I. It's just, I'm learning so much and also, I know now that World War I is actually pretty relevant, like through the lines of courage. I learned about the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu took place during World War I, and we have COVID right now. It's kind of similar, and there are even more ways that both now and hundreds of years ago are similar. Well, you look at, um, you know, Russia, their involvement in the war and, and the way that the Tsar, I mean, he sent his soldiers, so many of them to the front lines without helmets, without weapons and just counted that, of course, we're going to win. We have the biggest army. And, uh, and so now you look at what is happening with the invasion of Ukraine. If we understand World War I, we know how things are going to end. And it won't end up well for Putin simply because we know how things went 100 plus years ago. So I know that you finished Lines of Courage before the Ukraine crisis now. Like, it, are you, I feel like you're learning probably a, more about World War One, about lines of courage and how it relates to now World War One. like even as we speak, because there's so much going on that's similar to World War One, that's similar to the world wars and hundreds of years later. Well, history repeats itself. Like, like you mentioned, the, the pandemic. Um, if, if we know our history, we know the future. And more importantly, we know we don't have to be afraid of the future because we know we've gotten through hard times before, we'll get through them again. I'm just trying to type what you just said down. I'm trying to quote you on that. That's just an amazing quote. <laughs> if, we know the, if we know history, then we know the future. That's, That's amazing. That. Yeah, thank you. You're, I, for, I should make a list of quotes from this interview. You've said so much that's just so inspiring. Well, great. Tell my kids that I say <laughs> things worth listening to. I hope <laughs> yeah. they'll hear that. 
I'll definitely try and get in touch with them and tell them that you are amazing. You tell, you say some pretty incredible things. All right. You do that. Like, and if not, I'll tell them that you said so. <laughs> yeah. I'll, and I'll send you video proof so they can take my word for it. I will so put that up. We'll play it every night right before dinner. <laughs> yeah. So I'm so grateful I had the opportunity to read an advanced reader's copy of your newest book, Lines of Courage. As a history fan, I can tell you, it's hard to find current middle grade historical fiction novels written about World War I. Would you share some of the ways in which you prepared and researched for writing Lines of Courage? Yeah, uh, this was tricky because I was coming at it from uh, five different perspectives and five different countries and over the whole war. So the mass of um, information to, uh, to get, it was by far the most research in terms of volume uh, because, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know, there was just so much. And so a lot of it was about um, breaking it down into parts as I needed it. And, uh, and then really, um, I used a lot of images mm -hmm. because, you know, having the pictures really helps. Um, and uh, definitely maps. And, uh, and really, it was just about every time I get to a new country or a new topic, diving in. So really, it was like researching five books on the same topic. Um, so yeah, research was nuts for this one. It sounds like a lot of research, but you powered through it and you never gave up. And now I think this is by far, um, I love Lines of Courage, one of my favorite historical fiction reads. It's just, I, I can tell the amount of research because before reading Lines of Courage, I knew practically nothing about World War I. It's not as famous as World War II because of all the stuff that happened then, but still a lot of things, a lot of important events happened in World War I, but they're not as highly documented. Yeah, oh, it's a fascinating war. I mean, just to give you one example, the in 1916, right? Juliet, when she's escaping from Verdun, that is the longest single war in world history. Wow. Uh, like single battle, single yeah. battle in world history. And uh, when World War I ended, we began to clean up the area of Verdun um, today, like because it was declared a red zone, not safe for people. We are still cleaning up that area today. Wow. Yeah. Still, areas of Verdun, there's areas that are still a red zone. At our current rate of cleanup, it will be another 300 years until the entire area is fully safe. How can that not be just a fascinating thing that to know so about World War so fascinating. Right. So, like, are there still landmines and just, like, hidden battles and traps, like, still mm -hmm. going on in Verdun that we haven't even found? There's that, there's, you know, chemicals that are, you know, down into the soil, um, you know, contaminated areas of water and, and Verdun, most of it is, is coming back and it is great, but wow, that's so there awesome. is still devastation that, that we have to address and, and clean up, uh, you know, even a hundred years later. That kind of makes me think like Verdun is still an ongoing battle in a sense, because like there's still chemicals, there's still traps like waiting for the future generations. I feel like it's just a long term battle. Like there may not be people fighting in the trenches, but it's still a battle. It's still it's still a place. It's not safe. That is brilliant. I have never thought about that. Absolutely brilliant observation. Thank you. Well, thank you for saying that. So do you plan on writing more middle grade historical fiction books? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I am uh, working on a Titanic story right now. Oh, my so, friends would love that. We, lo we all love the Titanic. I, I want to share that with them. Yeah, yeah. No, it's called Iceberg. It will be out in uh, a, another year. And that, that one, the research on that, like that we like, oh, there's just so much cool research. And then I will probably return to either World War II or I really want to do a survival story, either a mine rescue or the San Francisco earthquake. I haven't decided, but yes, many more historicals to come. And I'm so excited for what's to come. Like the Titanic, that's like, I think, do you actually go um, to these places? Maybe not the Titanic, but like Europe to learn more about World War I? Uh, when I can. I mean, COVID really restricted yeah. a lot of those possibilities, but I'm planning travel back there again because there is a difference between reading about it and standing there. And so as much as possible, I do want to be on site to do research. Just not the Titanic. Can't hold yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know if you can read the Titanic. That's pretty deep. (laughs) But I am excited for your Titanic read and more historical fiction to come because just from reading Lines of Courage, I know that you have a you have a way with words. They're like the way you describe all the events, the characters. It's I when I started reading Lines of Courage, I just thought it was so graphic. One of the most graphic books I've read. Like you kind of made it scary but also just so intense and excite excited like all the emotions I just I felt so many emotions because your writing is so graphic and I felt like I was there wow thank you that's a huge compliment well it's definitely deserved thank you so what's the most challenging thing about being a middle grade writer um uh finding that balance I guess you know of yeah of especially you know, I mean, writing exciting books and engaging books and and especially books that are accurate to some very difficult times in history and finding the balance between um, helping middle grade readers understand it without crossing lines into areas that it's like, you know what, that just gets a little heavy and a little dark. And and so um, that's always a bit of a challenge to find to find that right balance. But when I do and everything works, um, I feel like it opens the doors for the middle grade reader to then go on and learn more as, as they grow and as they want to learn more. You know, I certainly want to learn more after, after reading Lines of Courage, after reading The False Prince, because I just, I feel like you found a perfect balance. You're very good at finding a balance. Like at some moments, I felt scared, but I was also, I wanted to know more. I wanted to learn more. Like even when events were intense and like, I was like, I can't watch, I can't read. I kept (laughs) reading because you just found that balance and you kept going with it. Wow. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I appreciate this conversation. So I know that you love being a writer, but if you were a middle grade writer, an award-winning writer at that, what do you think you'd be doing instead? I think, you know, I live in this small town, um, you know, up a canyon, so we're a little far from cities. I would open a theater where I live and I would teach theater to young actors. I would still be working with kids. I would still be with a story. It would just be story that's performed instead of story that is read. That is certainly a job that I think you'd excel at because you kind of, you kind of make your writing so intense. And I thought that you'd you'd be so amazing at like teaching kids about acting because like, honestly, you, I'm the audience. It's not like a visual audience, but when, when I read your writing, I feel all the emotions I would at at a play. I think it would be so cool for like lines of courage for the false prince to just be a play to be performed at your theater. And I would certainly, I love acting. So I would definitely want to attend your theater. Okay, I'll, uh, if this uh, whole writing gig doesn't work out, so I'll, uh, I'll let you know when my theater's up and running. Yeah, I do hope that you create a theater. I think that would be so much fun for all the kids living in your small town. And for me as, as well, like I, I would like, parent, mom, dad, I want to move to your, I want to <laughs> move to your town. I want to see what's going on. I want to be an actor learning from you. Well, hey, um, we'll make, we'll try to make that happen. <laughs> yeah, I'd love that. <laughs> If you were trapped on a deserted island and could only bring one book, what book would it be and why? Also, try not to make it an island survival guide. I think that's a little, that's cutting it a little too easy. Yeah, that wouldn't. Yeah. No, I don't need an island survival guide, right? Because yeah. uh, because I've got an imagination. So mm-hmm. I could figure that part out. Um, this is going to sound like a bit of a dodge, but this is really the way I would think about it. Um, the book I would bring is just an empty notebook. Um, I don't think that's a dodge at all. It's writing your own stories. Mm -hmm. I would create um, because while it's amazing to read what others have written, um, if I had to be trapped on a deserted island, I would simply create more story. That that is not that is not a dodge at all. Okay. That's something that I would want to do. Like, because there's so much inspiration on islands. Like, you might it might be deserted, but. Hey, that palm tree. Hmm, I have inspiration from the palm tree. There's inspiration all around you. And sometimes when you're in your most simplistic state with no, like with no electronics, like you're just deserted, you can see inspiration in things that you never thought you would. Uh, exactly that. So that's, that would be my answer. 
Although I would, I, I would want you to publish that notebook, although it might be a little bit hard if you're stranded on a deserted island, so. Yeah, I mean, I'd have to start my own publishing company, so. Yeah. Um, but hey, Jennifer you know, Wilson, like Island Publishing. <laughs> island Publishing. Party oh, of That one. would be a great, that's a great name. It has a ring to it. All right, let's, <laughs> if the theater doesn't work out and the writing doesn't work out, yeah. <laughs> published from a deserted island. <laughs> that sounds like fun. I would want to join you on the, in that publishing company. I would be the book reviewer for all of your, for all the island books that you're publishing. That would be right. very fun. Party of two then. We got this. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Was there anyone who inspired you to become a writer, a parent, teacher, author, or role model? Um, you know, somebody who was really key in my life is, um, I had tried to write in sixth grade. It had ended in a disaster. Remember I told you like I quit when I didn't, you know, think my words matched what was in my head. And I decided I didn't have any talent. I didn't have any future. Um, in eighth grade, um, we had to write a story for class. And at the end of the story, the, the teacher, Mrs. Bean came up to me and she said, you know, this is, this is good. And the local newspaper's having a writing contest. I think you should enter. And I was like, oh yeah, sure. But in my head, I'm thinking, yeah, no way ever. Because I'm not going to enter some stupid newspaper writing contest. Um, Mrs. Bean entered the story for me and it won an award. And wow. uh, one of the things she told me is she said, look, you are a writer. And I needed somebody else to identify that for me because our brains that we have, it's our normal. And so there's nothing special about what's normal to us. And so I thought everybody has a writer's brain. Everybody's creating story. There's nothing special about the fact that I'm doing that. And Mrs. Bean telling me I was a writer, it allowed me to believe that I was a writer once again. And uh, I returned to that dream because of that teacher. Mrs. Bean sounds like an amazing, amazingly positive force for you. Uh, for every every student she, who ever was lucky enough to sit in her classroom. It's what she did for me. Uh, she worked miracles for a thousand other students over her career. And I'm so glad that she kind of gave you the inspiration to keep working because like that's what our conversation, it's, it's going full circle. It's all coming back to never giving up. That's it. So if you... If you could be any character or meet any character in any book, who would you be or who would you meet and why? I would love to meet Harry Potter. I would love to just sit down over lunch and just ask a bunch of questions about things he did right and things he did wrong. And uh, I just think that would be really amazing. Like, I'm kind of ticked off he's not real because I know that those questions will just always have to stay with me. But... I would love, love just one lunch with Harry. So thank you so much for joining me today. It's just an honor to talk with you and learn about your books and just everything books. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to be here. I wish you every good thing as you continue your podcast. I hope I can continue and I hope that we can stay in touch. Absolutely. Reach out at any time. And thanks to all of your listeners for being here. It is truly an honor and an absolute dream come true to talk with you. And I really, yeah, I do hope that we can stay in touch. And I know that all of you listening, you are going to love Lines of Courage. I know that you're going to love it as much as I did because it's five, It's all different multiple, it's multiple points of view. It's just a fun, entertaining storyline. And you're just going to love it. I got to say, it's amazing. It's amazing what Jennifer Nielsen is doing for the writing community, for the book community. And it's just an honor to have been chatting with her. And you can find Jennifer Nielsen on Twitter and on Instagram. She's active on both. And just stay safe, happy reading, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks so much. Bye.